Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice introduction. Um, I will, my, my talk will be uh, traveling from lab-based research to clinical uh, research, and, and you'll see that sometimes it's hard to link both, and, uh, and that's actually what we face in a day-to-day -day basis. So what we're trying to do in my lab is to come up with new ways to uh, provide researcher and clinician with interventions that are improving cognition. Um, which means that sometimes we deal with patients, but sometimes we also deal with computers and lab uh, instrumentations. Um, let's start, well, I don't need this introduction with you guys, but uh, usually I, I like to uh, promote the research in aging in general, and I think this morning we, just, we can just skip this slide, but just, uh, just want to point it out that uh, the risk for dementia is, is something that we're obsessed with, of course, and there's a huge initiative that's being launched soon by the Canadian Institute of Aging. Uh, with large portion of money, or of our taxpayer money, on um, Alzheimer disease and the prevention of neurodegenerative disease. But we still have to think that a great proportion of older adults don't have dementia, uh, but they do have uh, chronic diseases that, 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 that come with uh, great impact on cognition. And even after 85 years old, which is the fastest growing segment of the population right now, um, half of them will not suffer from uh, degenerative disease, neurodegenerative disease and dementia, which means that half of them needs uh, a different approach to help them maintain cognition. So that sets the tone for my talk because I'm not going to uh, talk about dementia, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, but rather stay in the realm of normal aging. But still, when we talk about normal aging, uh, we know that uh, age-related decline are, uh, are obvious. And they come up in several tasks that require a variety of per perceptual and cognitive processes. Uh, the most obvious change that we, we see in older adults is uh, a slowing in processing speed, what we call psycho, psycho uh, motor speed, for example. Uh, it, it shows up in, in most tasks that uh, require to answer quickly and, 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 and promptly to, uh, to uh, new situations. Um, it's been associated to a loss of white matter integrity in the brain. And an another set of tasks that also show great decline as we age is working memory. But the two, sp speed of processing and working memory, are, are, are heavily uh, associated. Um, and change in working memory will come up with uh, difficulty to maintain information, to manipulate information. Uh, if I give you a phone number to write down on a piece of paper, by the time you're trying to write it down, your working in process is working, trying to make sure that there's no interruption, no interference whatsoever in the, in, in the other information that's coming up. And that is that, that, man, that capacity to maintain in, in, uh, in the consciousness level the information and to uh, block interference is, is heavily impaired as we age. It's been associated in brain imaging study to reduced activation in critical brain regions. But brain imaging studies are going all over the place right now. And when we see increased activation, decline activation, and people are trying to come up with a coherent uh, explanation for that. The best uh, summary I, can, I could find was that sometimes higher activation means that people are working harder. But if the performance doesn't come along with the, the work, it means that the brain is less efficient. So we have to uh, be careful. And uh, I'll come up to that later. But we just published a review paper on brain imaging studies as biomarker of uh, cognitive plasticity as people age. And honestly, right now, I cannot say better than sometimes brain activation increases as we age, sometimes it decreases, and we don't even know if it correlates with better performance or worse performance as people uh, get older. So it's not a very uh, combining story right now. Uh, all this can be portrayed in, in a very simple slide that you, pr you might have seen because it's, it's heavily uh, communicated in the literature. And it's based on a, on a couple of studies by the Spark uh, group, which was in Illinois a couple of years ago, but is not in Texas University. And what she showed in a, a group of older adults, but we have to be careful here because it's a cross-sectional study. So we're talking about comparing people of different ages and not following people as they age. But still, what you can see is, uh, sorry, I'm going to try to bring my pointer. 
Okay, so what you can see here is a steep decline in most cognitive uh, processes that come, w that, that require uh, speed of processing, again, working memory, also long-term memory uh, will tend to be impacted uh, and, and the decline starts uh, roughly around 40, 45 to 50 years old. But there's still uh, some cognitive processes that tend to increase as we age. For example, people tend to have more loan age, uh, they acquire more uh, language knowledge, lexical, for example, and sometimes <coughs> with proper strategies training uh, and, and especially mnemonic training, they can learn to, to build on these ac uh, acquisition and, and learn to use this knowledge to uh, compensate for other decline. So that's basically uh, a rough uh, summary of what we have in normal cognitive aging. Now, if we're trying, as I said, to uh, to see what happens in the brain. Um, this slide is a bit busy and it's full of numbers, but uh, I would like to, to, uh, to tell you to be uh, cautious that it's, it's all come from trans, uh, trans, transsectional study, uh, and very few studies have actually followed it, older adults over time. So it's a bit biased by the fact that there's, there's a lot of, of, uh, of confounding factor here. If you compare an older person to a young person that's less used to play with computers or, or to be tested, of course you'll find changes that might not be associated to aging per se, but could be uh, associated with other confound. So it, we really do have to be careful, but of course brain aging studies are really heavy. They're really hard to carry on, so it's really hard to follow people over time. And it's costly. So uh, still, uh, you'll see at the, 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 the top portion of the, of the slide that the, we agree for a faster decline after 50 years old of the brain volume in general with, the, with the, a specific decline that's a little bit more steeper uh, in the hippocampus, which is of course crucial for memory and uh, for memory binding. But uh, among the rare studies that followed it, uh, participants over time, RAS uh, succeeded to follow, I think it, more, it Roughly 100 older adults aged uh, over 50 years old, which is still young. Um, and he followed it, them more than 30 months, which is not very long in a life, but it's really long as a study. And um, he observed that there's still some portion of the brain do, don't, don't show any change after 30 months. But as soon as 50 months, the hippocampus and, and, and the orbitofrontal cortex, which are very important in, in uh, speed of processing and also memory, tend to show uh, a significant decline as soon as 50 months in older, in the healthy older adults. Of course, and that will not come as a surprise for you. No, okay. But uh, the, uh, the change in brain volume, and especially in white matter integrity, will be, uh, will be more uh, evident if, um, if people suffer from uh, metabolic disorder or hypertension and, uh, and type 2 diabetes. Now I want to mention here, I, didn't, I won't show this to you, but we've conducted a series of study with people that do, don't, don't have diabetes, but they do have an abnormal, or not abnormal, but uh, uh, not optimal uh, glucose, curve, glucose absorption curve uh, at fasting. And we, all, we succeeded to show that this predicts significantly uh, decline in speed of processing and working memory. So this means that we can probably potentially act way before the disease is actually evident and, and try to reduce the cognitive decline in uh, healthy older adults. Uh, now, a very important point that, that's, the, uh, the, uh, the, that's the rational for the studies we're, we're conducting, conducting in my lab is the fact that normal aging is, is heavily heterogeneous. Um, as we, uh, as we go to the scholar courses and we all go to a college degree, university, we all think the same, we all behave the same, and, and results for, from younger adults on neuropsychological tests are, are not very fun to look at because they all look the same. And that's potentially why it's becoming so exciting to study normal aging because people tend to dif differentiate as, as they grow older. And some of them will maintain functional, uh, cognitive function very, very old in age, and other will show steep decline. And we don't actually understand why this is so. Um, so if you take normal aging as being 
very heterogeneous, and you look at different paths, different, uh, different path, you can see that some people will decline very early and show uh, functional threshold decline uh, very early in age, but other will show a different curve and maintain cognitive function very late. And as a matter of fact, um, a couple of years ago, a couple of papers were published in uh, neuro, uh, uh, neurobiology of aging, sorry, and um, I remember a case study where the woman uh, died at 115 years old with no sign of cognitive decline whatsoever, and the biopsy showed a, just a normal brain. That's one case, but still, uh, I think we can build from it. And, and, uh, and when I started to do research in aging, I remember that the mean age of older adults were roughly 60, 65 years old. And that, that was what we considered at that time as being old. Uh, now we have centenarian studies that are published on a regular basis. And even in my own lab, and I'm not that old, but that, you know, I, I experienced the change from my PhD to now. Um, the mean age of older adults have uh, increased from uh, 10 years old. 10 years, okay? So now my, my mean age uh, for participants in my studies are, is 73, 74 years old, okay? So that tells something. And I, I, don't, I don't force it. I just recruit the same way I was doing 10 years ago. And, uh, but people get older, they get uh, more active. Um, they live longer, we know that. And, uh, and they tend to be more proactive with it. So this, this was supposed to be my introduction. Uh, <laughs> what are we actually doing in the lab? Uh, we're trying to, of course, find new ways to prevent cognitive decline as we age. And the first way to do it is to understand to what extent age-related cognitive decline can be prevented and slow. And that comes with identifying health factors that are associated with higher risk of what I call silent cognitive decline. And I call them silent cognitive decline because my participants don't come from uh, memory clinics. Okay? If you're used to go to uh, talks like this, you'll see a lot of people recruit from memory clinic. Uh, they have a big part of their participants that uh, have MCI or, uh, um, uh, or report memory decline in their day-to-day -day basis. We tend not to recruit those people. When I see my cognitive impairment in my group, I refer them to the memory clinic, but I don't do research with them myself. So that's why I'm considering the decline that I'm observing as silent, meaning that it's not clinically significant, but it's still there. And if a person has um, hypertension, uh, not optimal uh, glucose metabolism uh, curve, for example, I'm sure I will see with my, stud my uh, research some uh, cognitive decline, and those can be uh, modulated by lifestyle factor. So how can we do that? Um, how cognitive function can be enhanced? Uh, we do that by both uh, boosting them with cognitive stimulation software, and also by physical exercise. I'll give you an example of, um, uh, oh, just before I go there, what, what, so what do we boost? That, what do we train if they don't have cognitive decline, if they don't have memory deficits? Well, the target would be then to, uh, to try to uh, improve executive control functions. Executive control functions are the mechanisms by which we control our brain. This is the mechanism that tells us uh, what should we learn. And if this piece of information is important, how can I concentrate? What do I do with this information? Um, how can I enter up uh, interfering information at the same time? Um, how do I inhibit um, um, uh, automatic processes that would interfere with this activity? Attentional control deficits are very important. First, they precede memory decline by up to three to four years in most studies. Okay, so when you see memory decline in an older adults, uh, you can be sure that several years ago, that person started to, to show slowing in speed of processing and maybe uh, executive control deficits as well. It's, a it's also a major challenge for older adults uh, to switch between multiple tasks, to enter up a task that they are engaged in. And that comes with functional impairment. Or maybe not impairment, but not, not optimal functioning. For example, we know that it reduces mobility and uh, postural control. People that show inhibition deficit or switching deficit will tend to be more variable in a force platform. 
It also impaired driving and increases the risk uh, for, uh, for uh, crashing. So it has an impact on a day-to-day -day basis if we look carefully. Now, can, what can we expect uh, from both physical exercise and cognitive training um, approach? If we start with cognitive training, I'm sure you've seen a lot of ads in the news, uh, and, uh, and, and, and science is also uh, heavily engaged in that. I was in March uh, this year. I was in uh, Los Angeles in a, in a, a, meet, uh, a conference called Neurotherapeutic Software. Okay, well, the name was actually longer, but I, I remember that two words. Uh, so it was basically game uh, builders, game programmers meeting with neuroscientists. And it was very funny because I could see that the market is huge, but science evidence is very low. Uh, actually, uh, game uh, brain training software, as they like to call that, is a market of seven billion as we speak in the United States. And the science supporting it is very low. Um, but still, we've played a, a significant role in there. And I've started to do that during my postdoc, uh, my PhD actually, and I did a couple of studies in my postdoc. And what I was interesting, interested in at that time was to improve what we call dual task, the ability to do two tasks at the same time, because that's the primary predictor of fall and, uh, and decline in mobility. And I'm going to show you two types of studies in which we show first that there's a functional impact of improving dual tasking, the ability to do two tasks at the same time. And second, that it can be used in clinical application with uh, people that, have, that, are greater, that have greater risk of functional decline in dual tasking. Of course, we're not the, the only one to do that. Um, if you uh, dive into the literature, you will see that uh, even uh, Jemay, a couple of years ago, published a very nice study uh, done by Sherry Willis, which, who is one of the leaders in the field. And <clears throat> what they did is that they used computer training uh, uh, with older adults in a large court uh, involving many, many universities. And they, uh, they showed people that train both at memory and attention training show improvement in attention and memory, which is not very exciting. But they also show a very limited transfer effect. What I call transfer effect is the uh, effect, the benefit that you will see in a task that was not trained. So it's good to be good at the computer game, but ideally, and I'm sure it's true not just for older adults, I wish it would be good for my, my, my son as well, uh, <laughs> training with a video game should lead to improvement in cognitive functioning in a day-to-day -day basis and maybe at school, never know. Um, so what we've been doing in the lab is to come up with uh, different ways to, to, to uh, improve uh, multitasking, and that's because we think that multitasking is the quintessence of attentional control. And when you think about it, it's, uh, it's actually true, right? The big challenge we face when it comes to controlling our brain and deciding what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to is when we're, we're, we're faced with uh, multiple tasks at the same time. Think about when you're driving and you need to find your direction and you know you're going to show up late at your talk. Your executive functions are, are working really, really hard. So, uh, so that's the setup in which we're, we're working. We have a, a lab um, built with uh, 10 cubicles. People show up three, four times a week. They're trained with computer programs that we develop ourselves. They're not very exciting. They're not funny games, but they're games in which we control for the brain mechanisms that are involved. And in this task, for example, people are asked to do two tasks at the same time, and on the screen, what they see here is the performance they, uh, they achieved in one of the tasks done with the left hand and one of the tasks done with the right hand. What you can see here is that the person who's doing this task is not very successful in dual tasking. And what she should learn over, over weeks is to pay attention to both tasks and to modulate her attention according to the task demands. It worked quite well, and in the past we've published a, a series of studies from 2005 to 2008 showing that in a variety of dual task conditions, you can improve dual tasking in older adults, and you can also expect a certain amount of transfer in, task, in dual tasks that have not been trained. Uh, the result scientifically look like this. So what you have here is 
Uh, the performance of older adults doing the training when they do a single task. So that's the baseline. Of course, they'll come, they will come faster doing the task itself, right? When they do the task alone, they, they get faster and they get better. But what's interesting is that when they do the two tasks at the same time, so that for a given task, let's say they have to, uh, to dissociate words or color, for example, very quickly at the computer. Um, and when they do it at the same time or uh, concurrent to another task, of course, uh, it, it takes longer. But what you see is that they improve. And they improve better than someone who would just practice without feedback or just repeat the task uh, several times. You can also see that the dual task ability improve uh, better than the single task ability. So dual tasking can be trained by itself. Uh, and you'll find improvement that goes beyond uh, speed of processing improvement that you see when you get uh, used to a task. Um, now, this is, I told you that I was traveling from the lab-based research to, to, uh, to clinical research. This is uh, what I call lab-based research. It's not very uh, exciting to see that, at least maybe not for you if you're, if you're a clinician. But what we found is that this type of dual tasking training that people do in front of a computer uh, with no uh, physical improvement what, whatsoever will show improvement in uh, balance and postural control, which goes along with uh, recent studies showing that as people show executive control dysfunction, they also show reduced mobility, slow gait, and impact uh, balance and, and postural control. What you see here is a group of older adults that, do, that did the computer training for a month and a half and were pre and post tested on the balance platform. What they had to do is just to stand on the balance platform, uh, two feet, one, one foot, doing cognitive task or without cognitive task. Of course, if you do cognitive task at the same time, it increases the demands and uh, people start to sway. And you see that the control group reduced uh, anterior posterior uh, sway significantly, and you didn't have this improvement in the control group that just repeated the task. Okay, so. This suggests that improving executive control just by brain training can also lead to improvement in balance and mobility. This uh, finding has also been uh, reproduced a couple of years ago by a group from New York. Uh, so we're pretty confident that this is actually something that, that you can find in a day-to-day -day basis. Now, can you use this type of software training uh, in a clinical setting? That was another question that we had in mind. And we, uh, uh, at that time, we were starting to study another medical condition that comes with a lot of decline in attentional control and executive control. Again, that silent decline, you don't see it on clinical tests. But if you use computer-based uh, um, uh, cognitive tasks, you would see uh, some decline. It's uh, coronary artery disease. And what we did in collaboration with the uh, Montreal Heart Institute, we uh, tried to use computer training as a therapeutic in the follow-up after gap surgery. So we followed a, a group of older adults uh, who received coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And of course, it's very demanding as a study because you have to wait in line uh, after all the medical staff and make sure that you recruit a certain number of participants. Um, some people that we call the control group here received the medical follow-up, the usual care uh, as they would receive. Um, and the other group was divided into two groups. One month after the gap surgery, they had to do an attention training uh, regimen or a memory training. And after two months, they were tested again and then uh, switched to the other type of training. So that's what we call a crossover design. So you do one type of training, we see if it improves attention, and then you do memory training, we see if it improves memory. And for another half of the group, you do the reverse. That allows you to look at the specific effect of a given training. And then we tested them again at three months. So here is an example for the dual task training. It's exactly the same task that I've just shown you. The person is in front of a computer trying to do two tasks, one with the right hand, one with the left hand. And what you can see is that the guys who did the memory training did not improve whatsoever in the dual task. 
but when they, they were switched to the attention training, they showed a significant improvement in attention. Those who started with attention improved dual task ability, and then they did the memory training so that the dual task remained the same. The control group, or those who followed the usual medical care, did not show, improve, did not show improvement in uh, attention capacity, and did not, they did not show transfer effect to the clinical tests. Whereas the group that did the training, both groups uh, showed uh, training-related uh, benefits in clinical neuropsychological tests. We're not the only one uh, group who's trying to use uh, cognitive training as a therapeutic. Uh, Sylvie Belleville's group, which is the scientific director of the Montreal Geriatric Institute, tend to show great results with mild cognitive impaired people. So she is one of the group who would recruit in memory clinics, people who show uh, mild, cognitive, uh, mild memory deficits. And she also showed that attentional training using dual task is a nice way to improve uh, executive control and attention in older adults. Um, and uh, so she showed that with a group of 24 uh, people suffering from mild cognitive impairment, and she also showed that uh, transfer effects were, uh, were there, with both training producing improvement on select outcome measure like focused attention, uh, speed of processing, and switching abilities. Okay? The improvement in those studies tend to be specific. So if you train for dual tasking or switching ability, you improve switching. You don't, uh, don't expect improvement in memory if you improve switching. And that's one of the mistakes that we tend to do. We tend to prescribe cognitive stimulation in a, as a general basis, as some people would prescribe physical exercise. But those training have to be specific to the need of the participant. Right? And that's the same for physical exercise, but we'll come that, uh, to that later. Um, I'll, I'll go a bit quickly for the next part because I want to switch to uh, physical exercise training and, and have enough time to show you uh, at least one clinical case that, that we uh, f found interesting. Um, but just to tell you that those improvement in cognition and those improvement in cognitive capacities on a day-to-day -day basis but also in clinical tests also come with change in the brain. So we tend to dissociate cognitive plasticity, which refers to improvement in cognition capability, and um, neuro, uh, neuro, uh, brain plasticity, which refer to change in the brain associated with this, this improvement. I just want to show you that the dual task training uh, that I just showed you, the exact same training that we did during the postdoc, and when I say the exact same training, that's the same software that we, that we uh, built, uh, show change in um, brain activation pattern. If you have look at the left part, of the panel here, you have the change observed from pre-test to test test to post-test in older adults after one month and a half of uh, computer-based training, and the equivalent change in younger adults. You can see that the training comes with decline in dec decreased activation in some brain regions, which come which is uh, normal because you, they get used to the task, so they work less to perform the task. But at the same time, in some brain regions, you have new activation that were not part of the game at the beginning for older adults, which suggests that there's some compensatory mechanisms that might come into play to help older adults to uh, perform at, at this kind of task. Right now, there is no uh, coherent signature of brain plasticity uh, as it's associated with kinds of training. Uh, a very important aspect that's lacking in the study, it's what I'm showing you here, it's a very busy slide, but what you have to look at is change in training as observed in, uh, sorry here, as observed in behavioral component of the task and change in brain activation. So in this study, what we showed is that the change in brain activation was significantly correlated with change in behavioral performances. But very few studies do that. So that's why we're limited right now with the conclusion we can draw from those studies. So some people would produce results from brain imaging saying memory improved, brain image changed, that's brain plasticity. 
But what we actually need is a clear correlation between change in behavior and change in brain activation so that we know that the changes that are observed in the brain are actually supporting the results we get. And very few studies show that. And uh, if you're interested in this field, I would refer you to this uh, review paper that Sylvie Belvin and I just published uh, last year, where we try to come up with a very clear story on using brain imaging as a biomarker of cognitive training effects. And I'll tell you the truth, right now it's very difficult to come up with a coherent story uh, in that field. We know that there's sometimes increase in activation, sometimes decline activation. The change in activation do not always correlate with um, change in behavior. And there's also a problem of recruitment. In some study, the uh, inclusion criteria are different than others. They're more, uh, they're more uh, fizzy, they're less strict. In my study, people are very healthy. If they have slight MCI, I don't take them. In other studies, they have MCI patients. So there might be a difference between those that are on the path of MCI and dementia and those that are uh, uh, dealing with what we could call healthy uh, aging. So to conclude on cognitive training, <coughs> uh, it works to some extent. It comes with functional benefits. At least we show that in balance and postural control. I think it can be used as a therapeutic in rehab programs if it's used properly uh, by professional. The brain imaging data show increased in, in, in brain metabolism metabolism but sometimes decline. Uh, we don't quite know yet why. And of course we need further study to be able to test the reliability and the clinical validity of uh, associated with both brain training software and associated brain changes. Now, what about physical exercise? Uh, you've heard of it, I'm sure. It's good for the body, we all know that. It's good for the brain. How does that work? Uh, we have more and more evidence of uh, older adults that can maintain a high level of physical exercise as they age. I forgot to bring the slide that I often bring, uh, especially when I come in Ontario, uh, but I just remember it now. It's showing a, 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 a frail older woman from Montreal compared to Ed Whitlock that you probably know, the marathon champion runner, runner from Toronto. And uh, usually the slide goes like, that's the difference between uh, getting old in Toronto and Montreal. <laughs> but, uh, so Ed Whitlock a couple of weeks ago, I think broke another record. Or, uh, so he's the only guy older than 80 years old who runs the marathon uh, below three hours. Uh, yeah, I, I met him a couple of times. I don't know how he do that. And he, he sh surely protected differently, th differently than other people, but still it shows that at any age, someone can uh, show an impressive performance and physical uh, capacity. And uh, you, you see here on the left portion of the panel, the guy that do the uh, water skiing is 100 years old. So, <laughs> yeah. Might be a fake photo, anyway. <laughs> so uh, there's enough evidence right now, and we just, uh, uh, with Kirk Erickson and, and, and Teresa Louis Ambrose, we published, uh, uh, we edited a, uh, a special issue on Journal of Aging Research and Physical Exercise. And basically, we all agree now that there's a protective effect of physical exercise being performed on a daily basis. Physical exercise help prevent cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, after short intervention, three months to six months, there is change in cognitive performances. They are specific to some function, but there's still a significant sorry, improvement. And this comes with change in the brain structure and function as well. Uh, I'll just give you some example of the studies that support this. For example, a, the, the big part of the study came from what we call translational study or trans, uh, transactional study. Uh, in this study, what we do, we compare older and younger adults. And we divide those that are fit and those that are unfit. And what we tend to show 
uh, if you do, for example, that was done by Melanie Renault, one of my PhD students. Uh, so she uh, recruit closely close to 100 older adults. She divided them by a fitness test as lower fit and higher fit individual, and she tested them. So she did the cardiorespiratory test, and then she did a bunch of neuropsych tests and computerized uh, tests as well. What we've shown in this study, and that, that's shown in many studies, is that clinical tests per se don't show difference between fitness uh, groups because they're clinical tests. They're used to detect memory decline. But if you use computer-based tests, tests that are more uh, specific and that allow you to test with more precision cognitive change, then you will show a difference between higher fit and lower fit individual. Here is an example of one test that we used. It's a test in which people need to pay attention to the, the, the exact moment at which something will occur and take a, re, a very speed, speeded decision. So it's called a preparatory test. Uh, it's heavily focused on attention. People that have brain uh, impact, uh, brain insult in the frontal lobes cannot sustain that type of ta task. It's what we call an attentional control task. And what you can see here is that <coughs> Uh, I fit individual tend to be faster and react better to the task. The more steeper the, the curve, the better you are. And the low fit individual don't show this benefit. More impressive, if you look at the motor time, psychomotor speed, you can see that if you divide the group by old, younger and older, younger being from 60 to 70 years old, older being over 70 years old, and you split them as low fit and high fit individual, it's, it's as if high fit individual do not show the effect of age, right? They're protected from uh, aging uh, related, age related effect. But the low fit individual show uh, the effect of age and the effect of task complexity. So the more the task is difficult, the lower is their performance. Higher is bad here, they're slower. Uh, and what's very interesting for me is that this is exactly the signature that is, uh, that is associated with normal aging in the literature, which means that it changed the, the, the vision that we have on cognitive aging if we start to look at people that are high fit and highly active individual. It also suggests that to some extent, Cognitive decline, as we know it in the aging literature, is biased by maybe testing people that are inactive and, 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 uh, and maybe inactive both cognitively but also physically. Uh, that goes along the same way. It's dual task. I'll skip this because for the, for the sake of time. Uh, another piece of evidence that's very, import that's very important as well is uh, longitudinal study. And that's that's more interesting because you take the same group of individuals that you will follow over time. So it's less biased, but there's few studies because it's really expensive and it takes long, uh, longer to do. Uh, in general, from studies that follow the older adults from two years to 10 years, we tend to see that those who maintain physical exercise on a regular basis more than three times a, a week tend to show less cognitive decline uh, over years. Uh, I'll go to this one with, well, maybe this one is interesting as well. Uh, Barnes was one of the first group uh, showing it. So what they did is they split a group of older adults as active, moderately active, and inactive based on a VO2 max test, a test of cardiorespiratory function, and they uh, looked at the cognitive impact, the cognitive changes after six years. And what they showed is a, a, a constant benefit from those, uh, for those who were active, but even in tests that are used to detect uh, uh, cognitive impairment on a regular basis in clinical setting, like the mini mental state examination. So this is the proportion of change that you would expect. Uh, so all these guys were normal at the beginning, and six years later, those who are active tend to show higher performance than those who were not active. Here what you have is in a larger group, more than 1,000, uh, close to 2,000 people actually, followed it over six years with no dementia, no risk of cognitive decline at the beginning, at 65 years old. And their 
uh, during the study for six years, and you can see that those who stay active and do physical exercise more than three times a week tend to show a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease by 32%. This number, roughly 30%, is quite consistent in the literature. We also find it in uh, many prospective studies, and in fact, um, Sophie did publish a meta-analysis of prospective study, which altogether uh, brought 15 studies to bring up the number of patients to 33,000 people. So all these studies together suggest that if you follow older adults from 1 to 12 years old, uh, those who stay active on a regular basis, again, more than three times a week, and even more so if you're what we call highly active individual, would show reduced risk of cognitive impairment by 35 to 38%. So it's still a consistent set of findings. Now, for the, for the last uh, portion of the, of the talk, I will show you intervention study. What I've shown you so far is cross-sectional study, active, non-active, or longitudinal study, following people that are active. But what can we expect from uh, a training intervention? When I talk about the training intervention, at least in my lab, it's people that have no history of physical exercise or very low uh, physical exercise. They're brought in the lab, they're randomized to a control group or a physical intervention group, and we follow them very carefully for three months, ask them to do physical exercise three times a week. It's a combined intervention with uh, aerobic portion. Well, at the beginning, it's more flexibility training, uh, strength training, and as we move along, we're in increasing the portion of aerobic training up to uh, sometimes 30, 40 minutes a session in order to improve cardiorespiratory function. Uh, I'll skip the literature portion. and Anyway, my slides will be available. What we're trying to do uh, is to, sorry about that. So what we're trying to do is to answer two questions that are very important right now in the literature, which is, how long does it take to see benefits? Do you need to train for six months, for a year? Most studies that showed very important results trained uh, for, well, used six month, one year training. And we know from kinesiology studies that after only a month and a half, two months, you start to see physiological adaptation to training. So we were interested to know if only three months of intervention will show the difference, will show difference. And why three months? It's also, we thought, uh, long enough to, to show significant results, but also short enough to maintain the individual in the study. And we're expecting that uh, uh, you'll, you'll see significant benefit. The other question that we are strongly interested in is the fitness level. What about the fitness level of the, of the individual? Does it work if someone is really low fit? And even more so, does it work, does it work if someone is frail or very uh, limited in terms of physical capacity? Uh, quickly, I'll show you two studies and a case study. The first study that we did was uh, uh, with 50 older adults, aged between 60 to 80 years old. Uh, they did three months of aerobic training and we split them as high fit or low fit individual. Three About three minutes? Okay. Um, then we'll skip that. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, it worked. <laughs> I want to show you. Oh, that's the slide I was looking for. Ed with luck. So, getting old in Toronto and getting old in Montreal. Uh, this study was published in 2013, so it was recently published in Journal of Gerontology. We trained frail older adults and, uh, and, and non-frail older adults, and we were interested to know if a fitness training intervention would allow people that are very limited in terms of physical capacity to show cognitive and psychological benefit of exercise. So the challenge was to bring those people active enough to see the, uh, the benefits of exercise intervention. And 
I will skip that just to tell you that they had a comprehensive geriatric exam. We have all the details on these participants. We know how many drugs they were taken, uh, taking and, 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 and so on and so on. So every result, all the results here are controlled for all confounding factor like the, 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 the medical record. You can see an improvement after three months of exercise in physical performance, in, in six minute wall test, and even in the time up and go test. Not big, no big surprise, they were trained, physically trained, three times a week, supervised, closely supervised by a kinesiologist and physiotherapist. But what's interesting is that those who did the fitness training program showed improvement in working memory, improvement in processing speed, and improvement in, in executive function. Those functions that are heavily affected in older adults that are not suffering from dementia. They are normal, healthy, older adults as far as the brain is concerned. We also showed improvement in quality of life, especially, in, of course, in physical health, quality of life. So they feel better, they feel more active, they're more comfortable with their physical health. But what I really like is that laser activity was significantly improved. And when you improve laser activity, you improve brain stimulation by default on a day-to-day -day basis. So being more active leads to more uh, cognitive stimulation as well. Uh, I'll take just one minute to show you a, an extreme case of this. This is someone who was not involved in the study. She was excluded from the frail study because she was severely frail. And we could not train those guys at the same time. We, we didn't have the resources, but we followed her for three months. And it was just recently published uh, in a French journal, uh, a geriatric journal. Uh, I'll skip the detail of the patient, but she was 70 years old uh, with a lot of medical condition. She was considered, uh, she had several fr falls during the year. Um, she had some cancer, she had uh, a lot of medication, uh, stenosis, arthritis, etc., etc. Uh, she did not show cognitive deficits. She was not an MCI. She was a severely frail older person with a normal brain, at least as the neuropsych exam showed. Uh, but the physical performance were all impacted, of course. We trained her for three months, and here we compared her with other highly frail or severely frail older adults who did not do the training. They were doing the medical follow-up at the geriatric institute. So they were coming at the institute, but they were not doing the physical exercise training. We showed, uh, after the training, less decline in physical capacity, in physical endurance, and uh, less decline, so everybody were declining over four months, and she was declining less. And we showed improvement, sorry, improvement in cognitive function, uh, uh, which was not um, shown in the control groups. Uh, so basically, it means that physical exercise, uh, physical fitness training uh, can enhance cognitive function. It works better for executive control function and working memory. Uh, changes have been observed in long-term memory as well, but over six months to a year of training. If you do only three months, the first benefit you'll see is speed of processing, working memory, and executive control function. The baseline fitness level do affect the result in some tests, but not all of them. But the basic idea is that even low fit individual and even frail older adults will show improvement and significant improvement after fitness training. And I'll stop here and uh, of course acknowledge the work of my team, a lot of physicians and geriatricians are involved and a, a big team of researchers as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>